Well, good morning, everyone. Great to be back with you here this Sunday morning. Uh, last Sunday was the start of Advent, of course, and uh, Christ coming to the world, and we look forward to uh, the weeks to come and uh, celebrating each and every day the Lord Jesus coming and preparing our hearts for that. And uh, I'll have a sermon series here. You'll get to hear in a couple of uh, minutes, I guess over an hour, uh, about uh, what we're going through with the Gospels when we come. But I want everyone to look forward uh, in their Bibles before we get started here to 1 Peter chapter 3. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15. First Peter chapter three, verse 15, Peter writes, but in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy, always pre being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you, yet do it with gentleness and respect. So the idea of giving a defense, giving a defense for the gospel, telling others why we believe what we believe, defending the Lord Jesus Christ and what he did in his death and resurrection on the cross. It's called apologetics. And apologetics is giving a defense. So we have a special guest here today. We have Andy Fullen from IUPUI with Ratio Christi Ministries. And he's going to give a presentation of why that word is so important, apologetics, and why giving a defense for our faith and a reason and using reason and using the truth that is all around us to point the world towards Christ, a world that is hurting and a world that needs the gospel. So Andy, uh, welcome to Grace Church and the floor is yours. And I'll pass out these right here. So this kind of notes from Andy's presentation. Thank you. Also, we had a, uh, Troy, I forgot to mention, we have a clipboard sign up uh, for, for people who are interested in more. Maybe we can set that in the back as well. But uh, it's, uh, it's great to be with you. Thank you for uh, allowing uh, Leslie and I to be here with you this morning. Um, so I do campus ministry. And if uh, you and I were going to go together to campus and, and do ministry, we're going to do some witnessing together. What might it look like? So I want to share with you some of the things that I've heard in my time in campus ministry. There's no purpose to life. There's no truth. How can God send people to hell who've never heard about him or the gospel? The Bible's been changed and is unreliable. Doesn't matter which religion you adopt as long as you're sincere. Rape is not really wrong. We had a professor teaching that one. I don't want to be part of a Christian hate group. I, I don't either. <laughs> First challenge I ever got on campus. All religion is poison. We just finished a Ratio Christi meeting. Uh, we, we used to meet in the cafeteria when we first got started. And we just finished. And a student uh, who'd been eavesdropping in the cafeteria, he wasn't part of our meeting, he came up to me as, as uh, the students were leaving, and he sat down and looked me right in the eye. First thing he said, all religion is poison. And I'm like, my name's Andy. <laughs> uh, what I said to him was, how'd you come to that conclusion? Yeah, tell me about why you believe that. And that just melted him, and we had a great conversation. He ended up coming to Rachel Christie. Okay, so this is, the, this is why apologetics. This is the problem, right? Um, one in four professors is an atheist or agnostic, at least one in four. Uh, more than half of professors have unfavorable views towards evangelical Christianity. 6% believe the Bible is the word of God. These are the ones teaching the students, 6%, right? And over half uh, say the Bible is fairy tales. So <laughs> there was a key study done asking students, why are you leaving? Why are you walking away from the church? And uh, in this book, Soul Searching, the answer was, the, at least one of the top answers was primarily because of intellectual skepticism and doubt. Well, I wonder why <laughs> they have that uh, when the trainers that are training them uh, have the worldview that they have. There are two major kinds of attacks against the church on campus. One is the naturalistic attack. And this is the argument that Christianity is irrational, right? Uh, and this one has been around for a while. This is in the curriculum. This is the idea that you know, science and faith 
our enemies and you know how can you believe you got to check your brain at the door if you're going to be a christian that kind of stuff uh, naturalism is assumed to be true uh no supernatural allowed that kind of thing that one we're, we're familiar with it's very very uh, powerful there's another kind of attack and it's a moral attack and this attack says christianity isn't good we don't care whether it's true or not it's not good how can it not be good it's intolerant. It's hateful. It's oppressive. Okay, this kind of thing. Uh, and, and the thing about it is both of these worldviews have significant intimidating, hushing power. Students are afraid of these. They're afraid to talk about uh, certain issues because of this kind of thing. And uh, couple all this with the fact that only about 2% of Christians can defend their faith intellectually. If you're challenged, well, why should you believe the Bible is true? Uh, why do you believe Jesus was God? Not a lot of Christians have been trained to be able to actually give an intellectual argument for that, uh, which is why we see these statistics uh, that Barna and Pew Research, and I, I mean, there are a lot of these that are showing that students, when they go to college, they walk away from the church over half. Uh, now, you might be thinking, you know, some of this stuff doesn't just sound like campus issues. Like when I look around the culture, I go to work, I see how what my corporate environment is. This is, doesn't seem like it's just relegated to campus. Exactly. Exactly. What starts in the campus filters into the culture. Okay. And so if you're looking around at our culture and saying, this kind of sounds like stuff going on in the culture, that's exactly right. And it started in the campus and it's now here. Uh, a recent Pew Research study showed that uh, self-identified Christians, that, that number is going down from 63, or from 78% in 2007 to about 63% now. The decline is found primarily among Protestant Christians. Catholicism seems to be holding pretty steady, but Protestantism is not uh, doing as well. Uh, only about 45% of U.S. adults pray daily. So half your neighbors don't pray every day. This is down, and this number is particularly alarming to me. In 2007, about 16% of Americans said they were secular. Now it's 30, just in that amount of time. Uh, that means one in three people identifies as an atheist, an agnostic, or nothing in particular. None, they call them. So given these stats, it may not be surprising to learn that only four in 10 adults consider religion very important in your life, in their lives. So if you think about your neighbors, how many of them actually consider religion important? There's a lot of work for us to do, isn't there? <laughs> There's a lot, but God's put us here for a reason. So what do we do about all this, right? So Ratio Christi is the ministry I work for. Uh, Ratio Christi means reason of Christ, and that's what our goal is to do, is to share the reasons for the faith that we have. Um, we try to do that by uh, ministering in various areas, as I'll, as I'll show for you, but especially on the college campus. Uh, we set up clubs, we train students, we reach out to faculty, and try to teach them the philosophical, scientific, and historical reasons to believe. Those are, those are friends of Christianity, they're not enemies. Science is not an enemy of, of Christianity, all right? Uh, all truth is God's truth, right? So uh, we want to train people in how to see this uh, so that they can make a reasonable uh, step of faith. So that's what Ratio Christi is. That's what we're trying to do. Slide is, there we go. So what does that look like? Here are some of the kinds of things in which we are engaging, some of the kinds of issues, arguments for God's existence, evidence for the resurrection, how do we answer the problem of evil and suffering? We have good answers to that. Reliability of scripture. Is the Bible really reliable? Yes, it is. How do we know that? What's the evidence? Is it really the word of God? Yes, it is. How do we know that? How do you make a case for that? So that's what we're trying to help students do. What about evolution? What about all the cultural issues like LGBT and uh, critical theory and abortion, pro-life, all that stuff? A lot of questions about that students have. We're trying to help them work through those. Uh, other religions. A lot of students are exposed to other worldviews for the first time when they go to campus. They've never sat with somebody who's a Muslim 
or a Hindu, right? And, and now they've got all these questions. What do I do with this? What does that person actually believe? How do I, how do I process that? How does that fit into my, my Christianity? So we help with that as well. Uh, talk about why secular humanism is false. Christianity is true and that uh, Christianity is uh, reasonable. So those, that's kind of what the ministry looks like. Now, uh, I thought uh, I'd put a very uh, confusing chart up here for you. <laughs> it's full of stuff. But let me, let me walk this through for you, just to kind of give you a sense of what our ministry looks like a little bit. Um, as I mentioned, our main thing is to do evangelism and apologetics, okay? And so we do that primarily on college campus, but we don't just do it on college campus. So we have what we call college prep. If you look across the top, row there. I'll take you through that first. We have what's called college prep. Turns out uh, that students are questioning Christianity before they get to college, right? Uh, especially with social media, they're just inundated with all kinds of lies. And so they got a lot of questions. So we do prep. We, we will we'll go to high, like I teach a logic class for high school students. I teach an apologetics class for high school students to help prepare them before they even get to college. Um, so that kind of thing. The other thing we do is, is, uh, is college. So for example, I work at IUPUI as a chapter director there. I work at Purdue as a chapter director there uh, and try to set up clubs, help students work through things. And um, then we also go to churches. We do training for apologetics with churches. We just finished an evangelism training class with a church out in Brazil, uh, just like last week, right? Or something, yeah. Um, and then uh, we go to conferences as well and teach at conferences. So what I wanna do then uh, is with the rest of this slide is kind of take you through what does the campus ministry look like, the college one, because that is the heart of what we're doing. That's most of where we're spending our time because that's just where the, the battle is. <laughs> it's where we need to be. So our ministry uh, breaks into students. We, we're, we're reaching out to students, you see that over here. And what that looks like is we set up our own clubs. We help train students. Most of the students that come to us are Christians. They identify as Christians, but they would say their faith is shaky. They believe I was raised that way, but boy, have I got questions. And so that, that's what mostly, we also have atheists that come. We have uh, very strong Christians who say, I want to go out and take this to the next level. But, but that's a lot of what we get. So we help train them and equip them. We teach students to do evangelism. Uh, it's a lot better if you've got a 20 year old evangelizing a 20 year old than if you have a 50 year old evangelizing 20 years. Students wanna hear from other students, right? So we train students how to do it. We go out and do it too. We model it and then uh, train them to do it. And uh, they can reach a lot more than, than we can. So that's part of the vision of what we're trying to do and multiply the ministry that way. Uh, we also reach out to faculty and staff. So that's that next section. We have Bible studies with faculty and staff, and we have events for them as well, um, because we want to reach the trainers, right, uh, who are influencing these, these students. And then the other part of our ministry that makes our college ministry different from a lot of other campus ministries is that um, other student organizations, particularly other Christian student organizations, are part of the, the groups we want to minister to. So we go to a crew or a navigators or something like that. We go to some of these other campus ministries that are teaching the Bible and we try to train them and their students how to do apologetics specifically. That's sort of our, we, we try to stay in our lane of apologetics and evangelism. That's what we do. We're sort of a special ops ministry. We do that well and we rely on them to do some of the other things. So we send our students to their groups as well. So we try to partner and work together. And that stuff looks like uh, us going to their groups and teaching, or uh, their people coming to us, or we have large-scale events where we partner and and uh, and have talks with you know uh, Josh McDowell's or the, those kinds of guys, Gary Habermas is coming in and talking to the campus. We have hundreds of people turn out for that. So that's a little bit about what that looks like. Uh, Quickly, I'll give you a few, just a few testimonials. I won't spend too much time on this. Um, I can summarize rather than read all these kind of their stories, just to give you a taste of, of how this vision is playing out for us. Jacob was a philosophy student at IUPUI. And Jacob, um, he, if, you, if you're familiar at all with philosophy, you know there are a lot of challenges with Christian faith, a lot of athe atheists in philosophy. 
So Jacob wanted to maintain his faith. And so he'd make friends with a lot of philosophy students and he'd bring them to Rashio Christi. He'd bring his, his best friend, in fact, he brought. Uh, and his best friend uh, accepted Christ, uh, by the way, uh, as a result of, in part of that. Um, so he, he, what he realized is he would, be, he would start sharing that there's intellectual reasons for Christianity. And he said that really softened uh, their hearts and they were stunned to, to hear that, that most of these students just didn't realize that stuff was out there. Uh, he is now getting his PhD uh, at uh, University of St. Louis and his whole goal is to become a philosophy professor on a secular campus for Christ, right? That's the kind of thing we want to reach the influencers. That's part of our vision. Imagine the kind of influence he's going to have. Um, Deirdre was, uh, this is, she has an interesting story too. She was our uh, student president at, for a time. And one of the semesters we spent studying religions, world religions, teaching what does Islam believe? How do we reach them as, as Christians? And that kind of thing, you know, various religions. She was so moved by that, that she said, I want to get a job at IUPUI working while a student working with international students because there's a bunch of international students uh, that, that are on campus and she did she got hired and so she would start to befriend all these internationals and so she talks about in this quote about how she's had you know she's having countless conversations with muslims and hindus and this sort of thing how is that happening because she was working there and then she would bring them to meet with uh with us and so uh, it, it was cool to see how our ministry kind of birthed her ministry. She sort of took it and ran with it and, and how, it, how it grew from there. So that's been a, a really great thing. Those are the kinds of things we love to see happen. Um, Joey, just the thing I like about Joey, uh, his story, he, he came to Christ in college. Uh, and then the thing that he mentions here that I like so much is not just that he got trained in how to defend the faith, but to do it with gentleness and respect. How do you talk to people who disagree with you about the thing you believe and cherish the most in a way that's going to reach rather than repel? <laughs> and that's one of the things that we're very uh, strong about is uh, it's not just what you're saying, but how you're saying it, the kinds of questions you're asking in order to, to keep the conversation alive. So, uh, and he's now, uh, he's now studying to be a pastor. He's in seminary right now. Uh, as a result, he came, he uh, graduated with an accounting degree and said, I think the Lord's calling me to ministry. Yeah. Uh, this is just testimonial from uh, one of our ministry partners, you know, crew, one of the other ministries on campus that we, we try to work with and, and just talking about how we, we try to work together. So um, thank you for starting with the first Peter 315, Troy. Uh, because that is our, our go-to go verse when it says, you know, always be ready to make a defense. That make a defense, that's, uh, that's a translation of the word apologia, apologetics. That's where we get the apologetics. We're not apologizing for, for uh, Christianity. <laughs> We're uh, defending it. That's what it means. And uh, so why do apologetics? Because the Bible commands it. There it is uh, in one of uh, many places. There it is. Now, make a defense. Okay, so what I thought we'd do with the, our remaining time is actually help give you a taste of what that looks like, okay? Um, the proof is in the pudding, right? So you've heard about how we try to train students, so now we're going to try to show you how we train students and what we're teaching. So uh, since we're talking about making a defense, we have a shield up here, right, as our, as our image. And what I want to suggest is that I think you, you can see how that's the cross on it. Uh, so it makes four uh, quadrants, right? I want to suggest to you that I think that it is imperative that Christians be able to give a case for these four quadrants. Okay, here's the first one. Let's see if this build works. Oh, the anticipation. Truth. God, the Bible, Jesus. It is imperative that we as believers are able to give a reason why we believe in absolute truth, why we believe the Bible, why, why, we, why we believe God and Jesus. And I should do, do it in this order. Truth, God, Bible, Jesus. 
Now we use, we use acronyms to help remember what the arguments are because it's easy to sit there and kind of read it and study it and say, yeah, that makes sense. But when you're standing eye to eye with somebody talking, suddenly you say, what, what was that? What am I, what am I supposed to say? Uh, right? So we use tricks to try to remember. So these are just some of the tricks we're using. We're not going to be able to go all through, through all these, but uh, I'm just putting them up there for you to see. We have these different memory tricks that we use in order to give reasons why we believe Jesus is who he claimed to be. Uh, that he's God who died on the cross, rose from the dead. Why do we believe the Bible is reliable? So we have these different acronyms. Well, what I thought we'd talk about this morning, we'll just dial in on one of these. And that's the first one, truth. The wise old owl says, give a hoot about truth. So why? My question for you is, why give a hoot about truth? So this is now the interactive portion of our, of our class. Why should we care about whether truth is absolute or not? Yeah. Yeah. If it's relative, then anything goes, right? When Jesus says he's the way, the truth, and the life, what does he mean by that? Well, if you believe truth is relative, you're going to have a very different interpretation than if you believe it's absolute, right? It's going to make all the difference. Does he mean by that? I'm the way and the, the option <laughs> and the life. <laughs> I'm the preference. I'm one preference of, you know, that you may want to consider. Is that what he means? Right. No. When we talk about the, when he, when he says thy word is truth. What does he mean by that? Depends what you understand truth to mean. Now, I, I talk to a lot of students on campus and almost without exception, they are, at, they are relatives, almost all of them. Even some who identify as Christians are relativists. It is everywhere. And if you don't have absolute truth, then nothing else that we say matters. Nothing else you're going to hear here today will matter. Nothing else I'm going to say matters if truth is relative. Why? Because that's just my truth. You've got your truth. If, if, if we can't establish absolute truth, then the person who hears you talk about how Jesus is the son of God, and he died for your sins, and we're sinners, and, and the Bible's the word of God, and they're thinking... That, that's your truth. That's fine. That, if that works for you, great. But that's not my truth. Well, the problem is truth makes, we're talking about truth claims. We're not talking about whether I like chocolate or vanilla ice cream. We're not talking about options, perspectives. We're talking about truth, right? Truth is what corresponds to reality. That's what truth is. So let's take a look at how we actually give a defense for absolute truth. How do we do it? Here's how we train students to do it. This is the logical argument right here that you memorize, okay? Truth is either absolute or relative. That's the first premise. Second premise, truth is not relative. Therefore, it follows that truth is absolute. This is kind of like king of the mountain. This is the picture I try to get students to remember in order to keep this in mind. You've got absolutism and relativism up there on the mountain. We're going to knock one of them off. The one left standing is the right one, right? So what we're going to do is we're going to put both of them up on the mountain in premise one. Premise two, we're going to knock relativ relativism off the mountain, and therefore, what's left standing? Absolutism. Now, this follows logically. In other words, if one and two are right, three has to be correct logically. So the question we'll ask first is, okay, is one correct? Truth is either absolute or relative. Is that right? It is. Now, I'm not going to spend a lot of time going to this. Really, I don't, I don't think I need to because the, the bottom line on it is, um, logically, those are the only two possibilities. Because to be absolute just means to be non-relative. To be relative is to not be absolute. So those are the, logically speaking, 
Uh, and the law of excluded middle is the logical um, uh, uh, principle that we use, uh, which basically says either B or non-B. Uh, this is one of those principles that you use every day of your life. Do you know you use the law of excluded middle every day of your life? Just didn't know what it was called. Either B or non-B. Something is either B or it's non-B. It can't be both at the same time in the same sense, right? Very obvious to us. We know this is the correct. We use it every day. You just, you just don't know about the name. But So this one's very obvious. Truth is either absolute or it's relative. It's either absolute or it's not. It's got to be one of those. So that one's easy enough. So the real question is, which one? Is it absolute or relative? Premise two says truth is not relative. All right, how do we know? How do we argue that? All right, here's how we argue. Relativism makes my head spin, just like an owl can spin its head, right? So we're gonna use the acronym OWLS to remember the arguments to defeat relativism, all right? I know it's this whole thing's a little hokey, but I don't care about hokey. I care about can I defend it or not? So I tell students the same thing. I'm like, yeah, you're going to thank me for this little owl's acronym uh, and relativism making your head spin once you're standing in front of a relativist. So the O stands for opposites. W stands for wrong. L stands for learning and S stands for self-defeating. So what we'll do is spend the rest of our time talking a little bit about what do these actually mean, okay? What does it actually mean? So let's start with the O. Now look at that, look out. Who needs Spielberg, really? That was as close as I could get to an owl. But I know it's like, <laughs> it wasn't quite an owl, but at least it flies. Okay, uh, okay, so let's talk about the O. Relativism entails opposites both being true. This is the first problem with relativism is, oh, opposites. The thing is, if you're gonna be a relativist, then opposites are both true at the same time and in the same sense. But that surely can't be right. That is a violation of another law you use every day of your life, a fundamental basic law of logic that is basic to thinking. If you're a thinking person at all, you use this every day, it's called the law of non-contradiction. It just says A, and non-A can't exist at the same time and in the same sense, okay? So, for example, there can't be milk in the fridge and not milk in the fridge at the same time and in the same sense. There could be milk in the fridge and then not in the fridge at different times, or there could be milk in this fridge and not in that fridge, but there can't be milk in the fridge and not in the fridge at the same time, the same sense. Pretty, pretty easy. Most of the time at this point, students are like, duh, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Because we know this, we think this way every day. Fine. There's a reason we don't see signs like this. <laughs> Do not enter, enter only. Opposites can't both be true. That's why we don't see that kind of thing. We know this to be the case. All right, so why is it then? Oh, here's, I got another one. I was on a roll. Okay, the old stepping out in front of the bus, right? If you're trying to illustrate these kinds of things, these are different ways you can illustrate this to a relativist, you know? If your truth is a bus is coming and my truth is there's, there's no bus coming and I step out in the street, I'm either gonna be fine or I'm in a lot of trouble, but it's not both, <laughs> right? I'm either gonna, you know, I'm, I'm smacked if it's coming, you know, I'm in trouble. Uh, and we know that. So we don't treat buses coming down the street relatively. You know? <laughs> Either is or it isn't. And if it is, I don't want to go out there. So why don't we treat ethics and religion the same? Most of the people are going to get, okay, if I, you know, we don't treat step out in front of the bus as a relativist, I treat it as an absolutist. It either is or it isn't. I don't treat rat poison with, with relativism. If I take it, I'm in trouble, right? I either am or I'm not. Okay, fine. But suddenly you start talking about ethics and you start talking about religion and they become relativists. But look at the claim. 
Jesus is the son of God. Jesus is not the son of God. Those are making factual claims. He either is or he isn't. Law of excluded middle. He can't be and not be at the same time and in the same sense. Law of non-contradiction. I had a Muslim woman come up to me one time uh, on campus and she, she said to me, and maybe you've heard this. Um, she said, uh, well, we, we worship the same God. She knew I was a Christian. We worship the same God. So I said, um, well, how did you come to that conclusion? And she said, well, you know, God of Abraham. Both worship God of Abraham. So I said, well, I think it is true that we have some commonality historically, but what about the theological differences we have? Don't those count? So like, are you telling me you think Jesus is God? Oh, no, no, I'm not saying that. She said, no, no, I would say, well, I, I do. So it doesn't sound like we worship the same God. Very popular to take this. Uh, let's all just get along kumbaya. We all worship the same thing. Let's just focus on the similarities. Let's not neglect the similarities, but we can't dis discount the differences. The critical differences are, are what's important, right? If you tell me you, this, this whole talk is giving me a splitting headache and I need some help, and I say to you, no problem. No problem. I got a couple of pills for you. They're both round. They're both white. They both start with an A. They're both going to cure your headache, help yourself. Uh, just take either one. A lot of similarities. Oh, one of them's aspirin and the other's arsenic. But knock yourself out. They're both going to cure your headache. It's the critical differences that matter in truth, right? So uh, opposites can't both. You know, the other thing about opposites is if opposites are both true, then tolerance is the same as intolerance. Right? Bigotry would be the same as not being a bigot. But we know that's not the case. In short, if relativism is true, we've got a world of contradictions on our hand. So those are some of the reasons we reject uh, relativism using the argument from opposites. Let's look at the next one, the W, wrongs. Relativism means that no one has ever been wrong about anything. You think about that. If relativism is, what does it mean? If truth is relative, no one is wrong even when they're mistaken. Because it's just, you're in the truth all the time. You've, if, if relativism is true, then whatever you think is true. It's your truth. But that doesn't seem right, does it? My math teacher didn't buy it when I told her two plus two is 10. <laughs> she said, uh, that's absolutely wrong. We use these little illustrations to try to help people see that absolute truth is, is the case. Now, by the way, you might think, well, this, this one is a clincher. Nobody's going to deny this. I actually had a student at Purdue this semester tell me I gave him the two plus two is four, right? And, and so there must be absolute truth. And he said, oh, there, there are we've lots of ways to prove two plus two isn't four. I said, really? Yes. He, I said, go ahead. He quickly changed the subject. <laughs> Couldn't give me an actual argument. Yeah, he knows it's four. That, that's called volitional unbelief. I don't want to believe, right? I don't will it to believe. Okay. Uh, as long as there's something true to me, then I would be right, even when I'm wrong, and we know that's absurd. So this whole idea of wrongs is something that you can focus on if you're talking to a relativist. And here's, here's something else to consider. If relativism is true, nobody's morally wrong, because morality depends on truth. So if there's no absolute truth, then there's no absolute right and wrong. Because it's very plain there's an absolute right and wrong is a truth claim, right? So if there is no absolute truth, it's out the window too. Now, uh, what ISIS did was, was right in killing Christians for them. Ask the Christians how they felt about it. It's an evil. Well, 
it, is it evil or not? If it's evil, then there, you know, if there's no absolute truth, then you can't really say it's evil. You can't, they're just doing what's their, what's their truth. But we all know that's insane. That's morally bankrupt. The Good Samaritan wasn't relatively good in what he did. He was good because there really is truth. Okay, here's another thing to think about. Learning. Now, I think this is interesting. Think about this. If relativism is really true, you don't really learn. Because to learn something is to move from error to truth or from non-truth to truth. But if all you're doing is going truth, 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 then you've already had the truth all along. Because whatever you thought about it was what your was what your truth was. That ought to disrupt students who are at a university to learn truth. They, why am I spending thousands of dollars if I had the truth all along? If, you, if you're a relativist, then you knew the truth all along, right? It just does, it's absurd, right? But you people don't think through the implications of the views they hold, and so by lovingly, gently helping people think through these things, we can lay this foundation that there really is absolute truth. And then, of course, the next question is, well, what is that truth, right? And then we can demonstrate there is a God. We can demonstrate that he's revealed himself to us in scripture and that kind of thing. Um, but this, this why this foundation is so important to lay. Uh, whoever's never wrong can never move from a state of being wrong to one of being right. But whoever never moves from error to truth never really learns anything. Hence, if relativism is right, then true learning is impossible. And we would say, that's crazy. Particularly this, because of this. If you start out an, uh, an absolutist, then you can't really ever learn that relativism is true, which is what they want you to really believe. Because that was just your truth. Absolutism was just your truth. See how it's self-defeating. Which moves us to our final point, self-defeating. Uh, of, of all the things you get, if you get nothing else out of today, I hope you get this one, to start looking for self-defeating arguments, because they're all over the place. They're, they're a lot of times game stoppers for Christians, and they should not be at all. Uh, so what do we mean by self-defeating? What we mean basically is, it's, is that the argument that is given defeats itself, or the claim that's given, the truth claim that's given defeats itself. So, uh, for example, relativists believe that relativism is true for everyone everywhere. That's an absolute statement. Wait a minute, you're doing the very thing you're saying you can't do. Actually, uh, here's, a, here's a, a, an illustration of this. I was on campus and we were doing what we call tabling, which is where we have a table set up with like a banner, you know, that says Ratio Christi. And on this banner, it says, Defending truth and Christianity on the campus. Okay, so I'm sitting there and I hear this student start laughing. He's maybe 30 feet away. Oh, man. Oh, and, he, and I, the closer he gets to me, the more he starts louder, he starts laughing. And I thought, oh, he's coming for me. I know he's coming for me. And sure enough, and he's trying to kind of get, you know, other people to pay attention to why he's doing this laughing thing. He's drawing a crowd. And he walks up, he walks all the way up to the banner and he just says, truth. He slaps the banner, he goes, as if there is any such thing as truth, duh. And he starts to walk off and I just said, is that true, what you just said? And he just stopped. It was like a light bulb suddenly went on. He was like, uh-oh, I've just humiliated myself, <laughs> you know? And I didn't want to humiliate him, but I also didn't want, you know, 13 other students standing around to hear him and think, Oh, yeah, I guess there is no truth, right? So I tried to get him, hey, come on back, let's talk about this. But it's a self-defeating idea, this whole idea that it's all relative. It's just self-defeating. You see this kind of thing all the time. Uh, Christianity is arrogant. You're arrogant to claim you have the truth. Apply that claim to itself. Are you, is that the truth? That it's arrogant to claim to have the truth? Aren't you doing the very thing you say I can't do? You're intolerant, Christians. You're in, wait a minute. I'm intolerant. Are you not tolerating me right now? Aren't you doing the very thing I'm not supposed to be doing? You're being judgmental, Christians. Aren't you judging me right now? 
When people make a claim to you, the first thing you have to do is apply the claim back to itself and see, does it live up to its own test? If it doesn't, it's self-defeating and you don't have to believe it. You need to abandon it. It's like philosophical cheating. It's like saying all, you know, everybody has to live by these rules except us. <laughs> okay, all truth is relative. Well, that's an, ab that's an absolute truth claim. It destroys itself. It's like sawing off the branch on which you sit, you know? You make this claim and then you cut it right down, right? You, right? you sit on that branch and then you cut it right down. That's basically what relativism does. So uh, by way of review, any questions about that? Any of that, by the way? Yeah. Uh, I have a question. I was thinking more like along the lines of uh, you know, the idea that something like milk, you had, the, you had a picture of a milk and then the fridge. Someone could deny that milk is the fridge. Right. Um, how do you deal with an, an experience of a person? So, like, how do you form the maybe ethics and what's good and bad? Mm -hmm. Like, we're talking, you know, we're eating pizza. Yeah. I say you can't deny that there's a pizza here, but they can deny whether or not they like it. And I, it seems like sometimes the argument is more about a person's experience or their right. opinion, right. rather than what is. So how do you, when you're talking, especially when you're talking about contradiction, right? How do you deal with that because the person's experience applies a lot? And, a great question. I think you've zeroed in on a key mistake that that people are making. They're confusing preference with truth. Right, so a lot of people think that uh, that that's what religion is, that that they, they have what what's called a fact value dichotomy, right? So so facts are in one department and values, ethics, religion, that's that's in another category that the two don't meet, uh, as it were. So you can have your facts over here about the world and then you have your values and your religion over here. And what we're trying to say is no religions make truth claims they're making claims about facts jesus either is the son of god or he isn't so i like pizza i don't like pizza is a preference now it, it's it's either true or it isn't that you like it or don't like it right but you are allowed the preference to choose one or the other whether you like it or not but you're not allowed to choose the preference of whether jesus is the son of god or not he either is or he isn't you have to decide whether you believe it or not but he either was or he was truth claims are made uh, you know, and that's not just true in Christianity, it's true in all, uh, all religions, all religions make truth claims, even the ones that claim to be relativists, you know, like Buddhism, Buddhism makes truth claims about the world, it says there really is no God ultimately that, you know, and things are an illusion that that's uh, Gautama Buddha's great enlightenment understanding that all is illusion. Well, that's a truth claim. It's, uh, it's a self-defeating truth claim, but it's a truth claim. Right, so what, what you need to be able to do is to demonstrate to them that religions are making truth claims, not just preference claims. That's my short answer, since we only have a, like a minute or two left, but yeah. So I have a number of people that are the people who are the whenever there was an activity where there would be a winner or what I would call those elements, everyone. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. So much this kind of thinking yeah. where they were the creation, what we were keeping now in their just like that type of thing was leading people to come into college with these relative theories. I think that I think that is part of it, and and it's it, it's so pervasive in so many ways. That's one example. And there's so many. I mean, on social media, it's everywhere. It I I think it it's such now that. It's, it's almost, it's been ingrained in them, this whole idea that we, we have to be relativistic. We have to be tolerant to, and, and they misunderstand what tolerance means and this kind of thing. So that it, it's, it's difficult for them, many of them to even fathom accepting absolutism. It's, it's almost like it's not on the table for them. Uh, so they'll, some of them will just go to these abstru extreme absurdities to deny. It, they'll contradict themselves. We'll ask them uh, sometimes, is it wrong to rape people for fun? Now, these are people, we're asking this, these people who claim to be relativists. As long as you do what you think is right, then it's fine. 
but is it okay to rape people? Fine. Well, no, that's wrong. Is it absolutely wrong? Well, yeah, it's absolutely wrong. So, so you are an absolutist. Well, no, no, I'm not an absolutist. <laughs> you just said you were an absolutist. I just had that conversation with a student at Purdue. Our future engineers <laughs> and mathematicians and rocket scientists. So anyway, there's a lot of, yes, cultural, there's a lot going into this and they've just been ingrained to see it this way. So it takes patience, it takes kindness, love, speaking in gentleness, but people do see it eventually. Some, you know, some who are willing uh, do see, wait a minute, I think I've been taught wrong for a long time and you just got to work them through that. Now I know we're about out of time, but yes. Okay, good. Oh. Not all sexual people that I've come across are true relatives. As in some some sexual people have the wrong conclusions, like I said, right, that they're still that they might do this, that they don't, you know, um, in 275, they have to that and stuff, you know. So I guess with that, someone who does accept the message of that person, would you then be the normal path of where you're scripture and maybe how the resurrection? How would you come across a sexual person that would agree? Yeah, good. So once we once we lay that foundation for absolute truth, then um, I want to ask them what they're what they believe about God, um, and lay that lay that foundation, and and then that God has revealed Himself in Scripture. Uh, you know that the Scriptures are historically reliable. You could also argue that they're the Word of God. There are different ways to take it at that point. But my my general apologetic structure is truth. We need we got to have truth solidified. Then God. And then um, scripture and Jesus. Um, and then, of course, you, you can share the gospel at that point. That's the general, at least from a logical standpoint. So one of the, one of the things you have to do when you're witnessing to somebody is you got to find out where they are in that, right? Because you're right. Some people will accept absolute truth. Um, some people already believe in God. You don't have to give them arguments for God. They believe that. Um, at that point, you can pick up with scripture and talk that way. So that, that's the approach I use. Um, good questions. Well, let me close this way, since we're about out of time. Dr. William Lane Craig says this, the worldview imbibed at the university by future leaders and opinion makers will be the worldview that shapes our society. If we change the university, we change society through those who change society. Um, he says that because historically, that's what happened to our country. Our country got uh, taken by the secularists strategically and we believe secularism even people who say they aren't secularists have a lot of secular ideology already uh, so what ratio christie wants to do is stand up against this and say we want to be we want to reverse the trend imagine what could happen if christians could confidently give an answer for the hope that they have why I believe truth is absolute, like you just learned this morning. Why, same kinds of things with why I believe there is a God, why I believe scripture is the word of God, why I believe Jesus is who he claimed to be. If you could give those reasons, if students could be on campus giving those reasons, imagine how we could transform the world. Of course, it's all dependent on the Lord. The Lord's got to do it. Without him, it isn't going to happen. It's not going to be built. But imagine how he could use us in this vision. This is the vision we have does look like Rome is burning in some ways, but God is doing some amazing things and we're not going to stand, we're not going to fiddle around and watch it happen. We're going to fight back. So if this is the kind of thing you are interested in being a part of, um, I just want to say we would love your prayers and your support. Please be praying for us. Um, we do have uh, cards on the back table if you want to learn more about my ministry and what we're doing uh, that tell about Ratio Christi and how you can contact us. Um, if you'd like to learn more about how you can um, support us, or if you'd like my email uh, newsletter, which goes out every other month or so, in that newsletter, I am equipping you guys, my supporters. I'm not just uh, telling you, here's what's going on on campus, so I do that, but I want you to be equipped. I want you to have the apologetic training, so every newsletter has apologetics in it as well. If you're interested in that, we have a clipboard that maybe we can put in the back or pass around or something like that. And uh, uh, just give me your name and email and I'll reach out to you and, and we can go from there. So anyway, thank you very much for your time. We really appreciate being here and, and uh, really enjoyed it. Um, 
don't know if I have anything else. Oh, ooh, there's a picture of me when I was young. <laughs> I gave this I gave this talk to somebody at a church and they came up to me afterwards and they said that was really great thanks you might want to update the picture <laughs> sometimes the so, some sometimes the truth hurts yeah that's right um, how about if I close this in prayer Father we do thank you for this opportunity to be together as a body of believers and to talk about uh, truth uh, Thy word is truth uh, Jesus is the way the truth and the life. It's our heart's desire to be able to proclaim that to a world who doesn't see the truth and needs it desperately. So I ask that you would power each person here. Um, help us to, to, to take some time to think about how we're involved in, uh, in proclaiming your truth to the world, how we can be involved, how you want us to be involved, whatever that, whatever that looks like, and uh, give us the uh, faith and the boldness uh, to, to step into that and to trust you with it. Uh, we ask all this, not by our might or by our power, but by your spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks. Yeah, I take that. If you want to sign up for today, uh, this is a lot of prayer and support. Um, I'm happy to do that. If you have a link, if you're interested in the newsletter, yeah, yeah. We are starting a new sermon series today. We are going through the Gospel of Mark. Oops. We're going through the Gospel of Mark right now. Spoiler alert, right? We're going through the Gospel of Mark for the next couple of months. Uh, of course, one of the Gospels, Synoptic Gospels, that really shows us a couple of things. And with Christmas quickly approaching, my hope is that our hearts will be open to Lord Jesus Christ. We've said that before. And what better way to start the Advent season, which is last Sunday, and looking at one of the Gospels, looking at the life of the Lord Jesus Christ. The reason I chose Mark is because Mark presents the gospel in such a very cut and clear way throughout all the chapters in Mark. Mark focuses on the actions of Christ. It exposes Jesus for who he truly is, the son of the living God who was crucified on our behalf for the sins of the world. The gospel of Mark here serves a proclamation of the salvation that is found in only the Lord Jesus Christ. 
And Mark does this by a couple of different ways, but Mark does this by telling the story of Christ on earth in a way that really puts an emphasis on his sufferings, the human, human side of Christ, but the suffering side of Christ. And later in the chapters to come, we'll see that Mark, out of all the Gospels, puts that emphasis on him as a suffering servant coming for us. And he does that in a quick way, to the point. It's cut. It's clear. Not a ton of detail in how he does that. But I believe Mark's purpose of this was that if believers were to be unified in the gospel, it's because the gospel was effectively preached. And to be effectively preached, then we must live out that message. And we must live out that message as similar situations of persecution, as Jesus and his disciples did. And his disciples mostly did after his death, right? To look through the lens of the world, that if we're going to be together, unified as the body of Christ, the way that Christ has designed it, we must go through persecution. We must go through suffering. It's a big theme we're going to be looking at from weeks to come with the gospel of Mark. Before we go into this first chapter of Mark, I want us to think about a time where maybe we have cleaned our house for a special guest. Right? Maybe this was just a guest having coming over for a meal. Maybe we just clean up the kitchen, clean up the, the, the floors, we mop the floors, whatever we do. Or maybe, maybe we're looking at a friend or a family member that's coming for the weekend. Maybe we have to do a little bit more than that. We have to prepare things like buying extra groceries and making sure the beds are made if they're spending the night for multiple nights. And the rooms are clean. So everything in the house then has to be clean and waiting for its coming. Whatever the occasion may be, preparation has to be made for that simple sound of, right, knock, knock on the door. The guest that you're waiting for has arrived. So, so much has to be coming in and putting in and, and prepare, preparation for just for those two sounds, knock, knock, right? But so did Jesus prepare for the moment of his ministry and the revelation of who he is on earth. Not just Jesus, but so too did John the Baptist, right? John the Baptist was the one that we we're going to be reading about this morning, preparing the way for the Messiah's coming, making sure that the world around and the people of Israel were ready for his coming, the coming of the Messiah into the world. So turn with me now to Mark chapter 1. Mark chapter 1, verses 1 through 8. Mark chapter 1, verses 1 through 8. For it is written, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. As it is written in Isaiah the prophet, behold, I send my messenger before your face, who will prepare your way. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. John appeared baptizing in the wilderness and proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And all the country of Judea and all Jerusalem were going out to him and were being baptized by him in the river of Jordan, confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel's hair and wore a leather belt around his waist and, and ate locusts and wild honey. And he preached saying, after me comes he who is mightier the strap of those sandals, I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. I have baptized you with water. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. What first strikes out most to me in this passage is all the Old Testament cross-references here we, we see in verse 3, right? In the wilderness prepares the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway. For our God. This is a direct quote from Isaiah chapter 40, verse 3, that, that is looking at this moment that is to come in the future. And, and another one we see, right? Behold my messenger, and he will prepare the way for me. And the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple, and the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight. Behold, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. This is a direct quote from Malachi chapter 3 that is similar here in, in Mark. So the anticipation, right? The excitement of the future Messiah's coming had to be flowing in the minds and the hearts of all who read these verses far before his coming. And my hope today is that they would, uh, looking back here, my hope for them would be that they would prepare spiritually for his coming. Spiritually for his coming. What does that mean? Making sure they had peace with God through their faith, making sure that they were obedient to the law, to the people of the past who were reading this for the first time, 
We'd be, I hope they were following the ordinances that were in place, the religious practices. All these things were done in waiting for his coming, waiting for his coming to the earth. And now he is here. A lot of this passage has to do with John the Baptist. I mentioned that earlier. The lens in which he saw the scriptures coming. The lens in which he saw the world. And, and we can see this truth here. We can see all of this coming. And, and the Messiah prophecy here um, that, that we read about here um, in, in Mark, looking back to Isaiah, this was 700 years before the birth of Christ. And again, we can see um, the anticipation here with both the, the Isaiah passage and, and looking back to Malachi as well. And far before, far before John the Baptist would come and prepare was the hope of the people of Israel to be spiritually ready for the Messiah. My hope would be that. And I think that was what their hope was, living out, making sure they had peace with God through all those things. And we know in verse 5 in this passage that the people were flocking to him. Let's look at that. Pictures, uh, it says picture, I want us to picture a large crowd of people, right? Actually, think of more than that. Think of large crowds because the text says the country of Judea and Jerusalem were flocking toward them, this one man. For this one reason, that was the baptism of repentance. Think of a huge crowd, all the people flocking to him. And we know that crowds can get big. We all know this place on a Sunday afternoon. Lucas Oil Stadium, it gets so packed when the Colts are winning, right? So packed when, uh, when which, which uh, isn't the case, I guess, this year. But we know how easy it is to get a good crowd for something that's winning. But what about repentance, right? What about repentance? What about the topic of sin? But all these people are flocking and repenting of their sins. They're open with their sin. They recognize that they're sinners and their needs to be a savior, to come. And think about our society today, and a society where so often righteousness is looked as unpopular, right? The uncool thing to do. And sin can be the popular thing that is there. Sin can be glorified. Think sin can be approved. And there's so many sins that our society does that is celebrated. It'd be hard to name each and every one of them. But here in this text, we see someone, we see him, John the Baptist, who knows there's little time before the Messiah starts his ministry. We see people coming to him with a humble heart, confessing their sins, recognizing that they're a sinner, and repenting through this baptism of repentance. What a scene that is. What a difference in societies that we can see around us, not back then. And throughout the scriptures, we see all sorts of different baptisms. Today, we can be assured that the Holy Spirit baptizing us into Christ is enough for salvation and obedience to God. But here in this passage, here the people of Israel, in, in this age of law, we're using this act of water as a sign of repentance of their sins to God, right? Sign of repentance, baptism of repentance, is what the text says. So turning from their sins, recognizing that apart from God, they can do no good on this earth. Changing their minds, changing their actions, and changing their hearts to be more focused on God is what you'd expect during this scene of all these people coming to do with John the Baptist, this, repent, this baptism of repentance. But John recognized that, and he was doing uh, this by, John recognized that, and what he was doing by this baptism, and what he was doing with baptizing all these people, what all the people were here to do, John the Baptist understood that it would never own up to. It would never measure up to the one who would come. It would never truly be in place of what the one who would come to. So remember, John the Baptist, he had one job here. He had one goal. He had one mission to accomplish, and that was to prepare the way. And what was he doing? Baptizing for repentance. Let's think about for a moment of how repentance can prepare the way. Okay, let's think deep here about how repentance can be a first step of preparing the way from this perspective of what we're reading here, of John the Baptist doing this baptism of repentance. How can that be preparing the way for Jesus to start his ministry? So if we're willing to openly admit that we are sinners in need of a Savior, then our hearts will be open to accepting that Savior 
that what God has given us is given for us the Lord Jesus Christ. So if we're able to recognize that we're sinners in need of that, if we're willing to change our hearts and our minds, we'll be open to hearing what God has to say. And of course, we know through the Lord Jesus Christ, everything that God has wanted to say is now found through him. It's powerful knowing that this is true. It's powerful to know there's practical steps here to respond to him, to respond to what he has done by sending his son, recognizing our sin, coming to the conclusion that there's nothing on our own accord that we can do to please God. Craving a savior, the people were, and now he is here. And the opposite response here would be refusing to repent. What if the people refuse to repent of our sins? What if the people around us here today refuse to repent of our sins? This type of thinking, it's hardening of the heart, right? This heart isn't prepared for someone to come along and to call out their sin and to pave a way for righteous living that we know Jesus did. I'm sure we can think of the Pharisees, right? All throughout the Gospels, we can see the Pharisees Pharisees and throughout Jesus' ministry pop up. What can we learn from them? They were content in their religion, right? They were content in their rituals, rituals and more rituals. But what did they lack? No relationship. No relationship. And what did Jesus say about these Pharisees? He said, their hearts are far from him. They weren't prepared for his coming. Their hearts weren't ready. My question is, are our hearts ready for his coming? We live in such an incredible time here in this age of grace. And Mark records John saying, he says, after, he, after me comes he who is mightier than I. The straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. If we go back here in Mark, those are the words that we read here. Those were John the Baptist's words. So the time has already come here today. We can recognize that, that John prepared the way. He came into the world, right? The Lord Jesus came into the world, born of a virgin. He represented God the Father perfectly here on earth. We know that he died upon a cross for the sins of the world. And now we have an opportunity to accept that free gift of eternal life or deny it. The choice is truly up to us. The choice is, are we going to accept that gift? Are we ready has John, of course, prepared the way for Jesus to come? But are we ready to accept that free gift? But not just that free gift. We have an interesting spot here in God's timeline of history. We await for now the rapture of his church and then even the second coming after the tribulation period. Okay, so we on earth can look at this story. We can see how John is preparing the way. But we have to ask ourselves, are we ready for the way? We, top, we too have an opportunity to prepare for the way to meet him in the clouds, right? To trust in Christ, to tell others about Christ because it's coming. It's coming quickly, right? Today we stand one day closer than we did yesterday. This glorifying event. We know throughout the scriptures, we know one passage in particular, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 52. It says, in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, in the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable and we shall be changed. What a glor glor glorious thing that we can await for here on earth of knowing that he's not, that he hasn't just come a first time. We know that we accept that. There's a second to it. We have an opportunity now to look back, look at the gospels, look at how the people were preparing and know that another time is coming as well. There's a millions of people here in this country and billions on earth who haven't accepted this gift, this free gift of eternal life that he has given us in his first coming. These people aren't ready for his second. John the Baptist was used in mighty ways to prepare the way for the people of Israel of the coming Messiah. And today God can use us, us here today, Jews and Gentiles alike, by being ministers of reconciliation, by preparing the way to meet him in the clouds, the body of Christ, to meet his people in the clouds. Well, how can we do that? We know in, in Luke, sorry, Luke writes in Acts chapter 10, verse 42, and he commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is one appointed by God to be the judge of the living and the dead, right? Preach the gospel, 
share the gospel. Right? Remember what Christ did. Remember why Christ came to the world. We await that truth. We have an opportunity to share others about that truth. And reminding others that we are separated by God because of our sin. But we can do nothing on our own accord to please God in the flesh. But instead, God has done everything by sending his son in the likeness of his sinful flesh to be condemned in the flesh. But we have the opportunity to put our faith in that and change the world. We all know John 3.16, right? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever shall believe in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. The next verse, right? He has not come to judge the world, but to save it. Right? We have the opportunity to save the world. Jesus came to save the world. We have the opportunity to point others toward him, to prepare the way for the second coming, prepare the way for them to meet him. If he doesn't come in our lifetimes, to meet him on that day of judgment, for him to recognize us as a part of his family, to let us enter into the kingdom of heaven. We're just so thankful for that truth. We're thankful that Christ died for our sins. And we have the opportunity, again, to preach that message. We know that John is preparing the way. We have an opportunity to prepare the way together. So let our hearts be transformed by that. Let our hearts be open to that truth. Let's live out now here on earth that truth. Let's go to the Lord this morning in prayer. Father, we're so thankful for the John the Baptist preparing the way for the people coming to the world. We know that he came a first time, but he's going to come a second as well. And Father, let our hearts be open to that truth. Let us be ministers of reconciliation here on earth, like you've commanded us to do so. He who knew no sin became sin so that we may become the righteousness of God. Faith in you brings us into relationship with you, Father. So we're just so thankful for your son, the Lord Jesus Christ, dying on our behalf. And Father, I just pray that we have the opportunity to share our faith to be vessels into the world around us. In Christ's holy name we pray. Amen. Mm -hmm.